When the RMS Titanic went down after crashing into an iceberg on April 14, 1912, hundreds of people perished in the freezing waters of the northern Atlantic Ocean. One of the main reasons all these people were left to wait for rescue in 28-degree water, which would all too quickly claim lives before that rescue came, was that the Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats for all its passengers. There were only 20, and they needed 60 to be able to carry everybody on board to safety. As for why there was such a drastic shortage of lifeboats, that's because there had been complaints that the deck was too cluttered looking when they did have a sufficient amount. What's even worse, the first few lifeboats that were released after the collision weren't even filled up halfway, which could have saved so many more lives. Perhaps those poor souls could have been rescued from the bone-chilling waters a lot sooner if the closest ships passing by the Titanic's crash site had seen the flares and other distress signals being sent. But many of them didn't because of something called light refraction. This phenomenon could also explain why the Titanic's lookouts hadn't seen the iceberg until it was too late. There are others, however, who say that this was because of the fact that they didn't have binoculars. Long story short, they didn't have the key to the onboard cabinet where all the binoculars were stored because the only guy who had that key, second officer David Blair, was replaced at the last minute and forgot to hand the key over. If the crew had had binoculars to help them, perhaps they would have noticed the iceberg early enough to change course and miss it. The ship was also moving much faster than the speed it was built for. The reason for this was that the ship's owner, White Star Line, didn't want to fall behind schedule. In fact, they wanted to get ahead of schedule and surprise the world to make headlines for arriving early. Maybe if the Titanic had been sailing at a safer speed, it would have had time to steer away from the iceberg, even if it had noticed a little too late due to the lack of binoculars. Anyway, there was a whole series of unfortunate events leading to the ship's collision and the fact that so many people were left unrescued and their bodies not retrieved. So back to that question. One theory about where the bodies might have gone is that they were lost at sea. Only hours after the Titanic sank, a massive storm came over the ocean. The currents and winds would have swept many bodies up to 50 miles away from the crash site. This could explain why the first ships to arrive at the scene didn't find them. But in reality, the Titanic shouldn't have been on the water in the first place. Experts have now discovered that the ship's hull had been weakened by a huge fire that broke out during the construction process three weeks before the date of departure. And White Star Line was fully aware of the damage that had been done, but they decided to sweep it under the rug. As fate would have it, the iceberg hit this exact weakened spot, tearing a huge hole in the ship, allowing the waters to flood in, and sending her to the depths of the ocean. The Titanic made two successful stops in France and Ireland before sailing off to New York. On April 14th, the crew received reports of ice sightings from other ships. But the Titanic's path was clear and the sea was calm. At 11.30 p.m., a lookout spotted a 100-foot-tall iceberg straight ahead and immediately warned the captain. Because the ship was moving at top speed, the crew only had 37 seconds to try to avoid a collision. The Titanic's engines were reversed, and the ship was turned so that it wouldn't hit the iceberg straight on. It instead grazed the ice, which punctured a 300-foot gash in the side of the ship's hull. After the impact, the captain sent out distress signals, which were picked up by the Carpathia, one of Cunard's ships. The Carpathia immediately sailed at full speed to the rescue while trying to avoid icebergs itself. The Olympic was on its way to New York when it got the Titanic's distress signal. It turned around at once and also sped off to assist its sinking sister. Unfortunately, it had to travel more than 500 miles to reach her. Having calculated that the ship would only stay afloat for an hour and a half, 
The captain and chief engineer rushed to order an evacuation. Chaos ensued, and it took them almost an hour to lower the first lifeboat, which had only 28 people on board versus the 65 it had space for. In the end, the Titanic actually stayed afloat for almost three hours. During that time, families were separated as women and children were loaded onto the lifeboats first as the law of the sea dictated. Ava Miriam Hart was only seven years old when she boarded the Titanic with her parents. According to Ava, her mother couldn't sleep at all the whole time she was on board because she'd had a really bad premonition about the trip. While the Titanic was sinking, Ava's father ran to their cabin, wrapped Ava in a blanket, and placed his wife and daughter in lifeboat number 14. The last thing he told Ava was, hold mommy's hand and be a good girl. Ava went on to do many things throughout her life. She was a singer in Australia and a very outspoken activist when it came to the whole Titanic ordeal. She even wrote an autobiography called Shadow of the Titanic, a survivor's story. One person Ava Hart probably had a bone to pick with was Joseph Bruce Ismay. Well, she and plenty of others. Ismay was chairman of the White Star Line, the company that operated the Titanic. He was on the ship that night, survived the sinking, and was rescued in collapsible lifeboat C. Upon arriving in the US, he got a ton of heat for leaving the Titanic while there were still women and children on board. After the Titanic, he tried to live a quiet life out of the spotlight. He continued dealing in maritime affairs, although not so much with passenger liners and more with the British Merchant Navy. Professional tennis player Richard Norris Williams was on board the Titanic with his father. Given that the lifeboats, as many know, were reserved for women and children, these two guys were left to fend for themselves on a sinking ship. They did pretty well at first, but once the ship had sunk deep enough to leave the remaining passengers floating in the water, a huge smokestack suddenly collapsed and crashed down on the surface of the water. Perhaps it was purely coincidental, or maybe something more, but the resulting wave washed Richard toward collapsible lifeboat A so he climbed in. Unfortunately, that lifeboat was full of freezing water that passengers had to stand in up to their knees. These survivors were later transferred to lifeboat number 14, but the damage of the cold water had already been done. Williams got frostbite on his legs, and once on board the Carpathia, the doctors recommended amputating both his lower limbs. But the tennis star would have none of it. So he exercised every day and his legs slowly recovered. He even continued his tennis career, became an Olympic gold medalist and served in the army. He later became a successful investment banker and president of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Why didn't people try climbing on the iceberg to get out of the water? Because it was too slippery. Okay, thanks for joining me today on The Bright Side. Wait, there's more? Right! Back to our story. At first, this seemed to be an easy fix, but as I started to look into it, I found some logistical problems that would make it more like a frozen nightmare than a frosty lifeboat. In the meantime, let's talk about slopes. Ice slopes, to be specific. You probably don't need me to tell you that an iceberg isn't just a giant ice cube in the ocean, but it's essential to draw a distinction between an ice flow and an iceberg. We'll save ice capades for another time. A flow, spelled F-L-O-E, is a flat mass of ice found drifting in the ocean. Much like icebergs, they're the result of Arctic ice breaking away from a larger shelf. But that's pretty much where the similarities end. A flow is low, flat, and relatively shallow, while an iceberg is none of those things. You may have heard the expression tip of the iceberg. Well, the towering spire of frozen water you know and fear is only a small part of the iceberg's mass. The bulk of an iceberg is found under the water, and this is the part most dangerous to passing ships. Ramming into a giant hunk of anything is never good, but when the damage is underwater, things go from bad to worse pretty fast. Ice flows can be hazardous, but the concern is that a ship might get pinned and crushed between two of them instead of sinking outright. 
This is only a real possibility when close to or within the Arctic Circle. The Titanic may have been in the North Atlantic, but not quite that far north. No, the Titanic hit an iceberg. And if you look at any picture of an iceberg, you'll see that they can get quite steep. Sure, some might be scalable, but others are nothing but sheer cliffs of jagged ice. Best case? It would be like climbing a mountain. Worst case? A frozen cliffside. There are several images purported to show the iceberg that did the deed, but the most likely culprit is the one here. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't exactly strike me as an easy climb. Now, imagine trying to pull that off in the dark, using only your hands and maybe a bit of rope, and surrounded by over a thousand other confused and freezing people. And don't imagine for a second that it would be an orderly evacuation either. Remember, while the lack of lifeboats was a big problem for the Titanic, a much bigger one was the fact that more than half left only partially full. As the window of opportunity to see the site closes, American company OceanGate offers trips down to the wreck. The first trip, carrying tourists, was supposed to head down in 2018, but the weather wasn't favorable, so it was pushed back to 2019. OceanGate has already conducted trips to the Titanic, but tourists have never been allowed on board. Dives to the Titanic have collected data, gathered samples, and taken pictures. Another company called The Bluefish has planned trips to the wreck in 2019 and 2020. Their submersible has a 7-inch acrylic window to get the best view. As news breaks that the Titanic is deteriorating, more and more commercial companies are bound to offer submersible trips to the wreck. If you think you can just head down and come back up the same day, the reality is a bit more complicated. The journey to the wreck involves an 8-day trip, which leaves from Newfoundland, Canada. Passengers board a submersible made of titanium and carbon fiber. After all, as you descend into the dark depths, the water pressure increases, and you don't want a submersible made of flimsy materials. Once inside the sub, you'll descend a distance of 12,500 feet to the ocean floor. The distance isn't so far if you were on land. On land, it would be like heading to your nearest grocery store. But when you think of 12,500 feet in terms of a vertical distance, dropping down into the darkness, the reality of it all might be enough to send shivers down your spine. As you descend, bioluminescent creatures are likely to make an appearance. The darkness is so intense at this depth that sea life has developed its own way of making light. It'll take about 90 minutes to make your way down, during which time you can go through all the stages of grief and panic. Maybe you'll start with denial. I can't be in a submarine. What was I thinking? This is too scary. Get me out! And then there's anger. Get me out, or I'll scream! Uh, how about bargaining? Uh, if you bring the sub up, I'll pay you double. Perhaps even depression. Oh, what have I done? The window will crack and we'll all drown. Finally, there's acceptance. Oh, the sub seems to be alright. This is actually really cool. After an emotional roller coaster, the magnificent sight of the wreck will meet your eyes and you'll get a 360-degree view of the Titanic, which you can enjoy for around 3 hours, depending on the submersible company. You'll be able to see the deck, the bow, the ship's propellers, the macaroni room, I mean the Marconi room, where the wireless operator sent the SOS as the ship was sinking, and the cavern that was home to the Grand Staircase, which is now really famous. In addition, you'll probably be able to spot a few personal objects lying on the ocean floor, mostly shoes and bags that belong to the Titanic's passengers. So what would a modern-day Titanic scenario look like? Well, a good example might be what happened during the 2012 Costa Concordia disaster. Sure, this shipwreck occurred in the warm waters of the Mediterranean, and the Concordia struck a rock rather than an iceberg. But the aftermath was similar enough that some comparisons can be drawn. The full story is as follows. The Italian cruise ship was passing close to the island of Giglio when it collided with the edge of an underwater plateau. Believing he knew the channel well enough to navigate on his own, the captain had disabled the collision alarm for the Costa Concordia's onboard navigation system. It was later revealed that there were numerous distractions on the ship 
such as the presence of the captain's girlfriend. Unlike the Titanic, the Concordia had more than enough lifeboats to get everyone off safely. Unfortunately, no amount of policy reform can completely make up for human error and poor communication, and failure to follow emergency procedures delayed the evacuation by more than half an hour. By the time the order to abandon ship had been given, the Costa Concordia was already beginning to list so severely that the crew was unable to launch many of the lifeboats. When the surf settled, 33 people lost their lives and another 64 had been injured. As bad as that was, things could have been much worse since the location of Concordia's collision did the passengers and crew a number of unexpected favors. For starters, they were within sight of land when the accident happened. This meant that help arrived reasonably quickly once the captain got around to sending his SOS. In fact, with the help of their life jackets, many passengers were able to swim all the way to solid ground. No one would be swimming very far if they'd struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic. When the Titanic sank, it was about 400 miles from dry land, and the water was a freezing 28 degrees. The good news is that in the modern world, things might never have gotten to that point. If the Titanic had struck the iceberg today, the Coast Guard would have deployed a small fleet of boats and helicopters to assist in the evacuation. Not just that, but every ship in the area would have made a beeline for their coordinates the moment that SOS message went out. With a competent commander overseeing an organized evacuation, this modern Titanic might not be considered a disaster at all. On the other hand, Costa Concordia shows what can happen when safety precautions are ignored.